We want to uh, look at how the Fed's rate hike path is impacting the health of regional banks. And uh, I want to bring in uh, Daniel Shrulo, a former Fed governor who led the central bank's regulatory reforms in the wake of the financial crisis. He's now a professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, thank you for joining us. How concerned are you that um, the way things are headed, if they are headed uh, or continuing to head up, that we are about to break something? Um, well, Andrew, I, I distinguish there between the economy and the banks. Um, you know, as I've said before in your program, I am I am concerned that the Fed has not been forward looking enough about the possible pass through of uh, the effective rate hikes that it took last year. Uh, and, you know, with with this, you never want to put too much emphasis on any one print. But, you know, this morning's inflation news just lends further credence to those who have been saying, look, a fair bit of progress has been made. Um, you're going to keep rates up. Uh, and we're a bit worried that uh, when companies need to refinance, when a lot of the uh, uh, effect of rising interest rates comes into new lending, that the Fed will, will have inadvertently pushed us into a slowdown. So that's that's kind of the, the economy as a whole. With right. respect to that's the, the, that's the economy side of the story. But let's yeah. talk also about the, the bank piece of it. Uh, because we just had Barry Sterling on. He thinks things are getting broken already. Well, I think there are certainly risks there. I mean, look, the the large portfolios of uh, uh, bonds and which losses have not been recognized um, continues to hover over um, the uh, the system, and particularly with some of the mid-sized regionals who might have deposit flight problems again. So I don't I don't want to overstate things because I think there's continuing vulnerability. But you know, Andrew, I think the real point here is not a near-term vulnerability. I think the real point here is the the ongoing business model challenge of these mid-sized banks, the banks between 50 and 250 billion dollars. I mean, those were the ones we saw failing and in trouble right. in the spring for idiosyncratic reasons. Well, so that's the question though. It what would you do about all of this? You know, we have this still, I think, implicit guarantee around deposits. It's clearly not explicit. It's not codified in any kind of uh, law. We didn't, we, you know, when, when this was all tested to the extent it was, Who? Uh, it, it worked. Uh, but that was not a, a series of, of banks all at the same time. How does that play out? Well, I think here's where, so, so what's going on right now? I mean, the big banks were just fine in the spring. Right. The 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 biggest, the four mega banks, actually, people were moving their deposits into those banks. So the group with which I think we're most concerned is that 50 to 250 billion dollar group. And there, I think, they're, as I said, they're just caught in a squeeze. And it's a little hard to see how that group of banks survives in anything like present form over the next 10 years. So to me, consolidation among those banks is a um, one clear option for giving them some additional scale and maybe allowing them more effectively to compete with the super regionals and the mega right. banks. The problem, well, you... yeah, I'm sorry. I just want yeah. to say a problem yeah. here is that the antitrust division appears to be saying that it's going to look unfavorably on bank mergers generally, not just among the uh, with the biggest banks, with which I certainly agree, but even among the regionals. And well, that that would just sort of put them in a in a trap then, Andrew. That's where I was going to go with this, which is I'm sure you have folks inside the Treasury Department who may very well be aligned with your way of thinking around trying to uh, create some transactions that, that that gives them some ballast and uh, uh, enough concentration to actually be able to withstand things. And yet you're going to have this other side of the administration that has a very different view of that. Who holds the balance of power, you think, on that front? Uh, on on bank mergers, I, I think the antitrust division has um, heavy, uh, an awful lot of weight. And here's the reason. So if the antitrust division challenges a merger in a non-regulated industry, you know, high tech or something, the companies can choose to fight it in court immediately. When the antitrust division has negative views on a bank merger, they communicate those in advance to the bank regulatory agencies the bank regulatory agencies, I think, are going to be reluctant to approve a merger that the antitrust division has right. questions about. And the agencies have lots of reasons to deny mergers, you know, management cap capacities and the like. So I think effectively 
the antitrust division's views will carry more weight right. in the in the banking industry. Dan, real quick, final question, and, and it may be sacrilegious to even raise the issue. Do you think that the United States has too many banks? That that community. I mean, there's an argument that has been made among some that you look at the UK or you go back and look at Australia or Canada. Just the approach to banking is so very different. It's much more concentrated. Now you could also look at 2008 and say, look, it was the biggest banks that got in trouble. So the idea of consolidating all the banks that's crazy. But there's others who say it actually would be the answer to a lot of these issues. So Andrew, in 1984, there are about 14,500 banks in the United States. Today, there are about 4,000. So this trend to consolidation really has been continuing and was accelerated when the restrictive branching and interstate banking laws were liberalized. Um, and I, I, you know, we've definitely seen that with community banks over the past 20 years or so. And I'm hoping that what's happening is that it's making the surviving community banks stronger, you know, those that really do have a capacity to have good relationship banking. So I think when you ask that normative question, is it is it good or bad? I actually think the answer is the positive question. There's going to be more consolidation. The question is, will the banking agencies and the antitrust division be keeping an eye on the end game? What does the competitive landscape look like after this consolidation is complete?